Hello and welcome dear students. Today our topic is constitutionalism in Nepal and Burma success or failure. In this lecture we will discuss about number first understanding the meaning of constitutionalism. Critically examine the success or failure story of constitutionalism of two countries of South Asia, Nepal and Burma. Dear students, let us begin with the meaning of constitutionalism. Constitutionalism is a modern concept that desires a political order governed by laws and regulations. It stands for the supremacy of law and not of the individuals. It imbibes the principles of nationalism, democracy and limited government. It may be identified with the system of divided power. As Patrick says, I quote, constitutionalism by dividing power provides a system of effective restraints upon governmental action. In studying it, one has to explore the methods and techniques by which such restraints are established and maintained. It is a body of rules ensuring fair play, thus rendering the government responsible." Unquote. Constitutionalism thus stands for the existence of a constitution in a state. Since it is the instrument of government or the fundamental law of the land, whose objects are to limit the arbitrary action of the government to guarantee the rights of the governed and to define the operation of the sovereign power. Dear students, in order to have a proper understanding of the term constitutionalism, we must first understand the meaning of the term like constitution and constitutional government. A constitution may be said to be a collection of principles according to which the powers of the government, the rights of the governed and the relations between the two are adjusted. In other words, it may be described as a frame of political society organized through and by law, in which law has established permanent institutions with recognized functions and definite rights. The constitution refers to a frame of political society organized through and by means of law in which law has established permanent institutions with recognized functions and definite rights. A constitutional state is one in which the powers of the government, the rights of the governed and the relations between the two are adjusted. According to where constitutional government means something more than a government according to the terms of a constitution. It means government according to rule as opposed to arbitrary government limited by the terms of constitution, not government limited only by the desires and capacities of those who exercise power. From the above, it may be inferred that constitutional government is one that operates within a universe of positive restraints. It is, however, a different matter that the degree of restraint may vary from one political system to another. That is, while one state may be constitutional by virtue of being set in a universe of more restraints, the other may be of the same category by virtue of being set in a universe of few restraints. The charge of being unconstitutional can be leveled against a state only if it has no restraints. Constitutionalism in this way desires a political order in which the powers of the government are limited. It is another name for the concept of a limited and for this reason a civilized government. 
the real justification of the constitution find a place in having a limited government and of requiring those who govern to confirm to laws and rules. We are required to see how the constitution of a state works in actual practice and whether usages and conventions operate to strengthen or weaken the machinery of constitutional arrangement. We may find that apart from those limitations that have their place in the provisions of the constitution, there are well established customs and norms that have their own effect for the same purpose. Keeping such empirical facts in mind, one may say that there exists no government in the world that may not be called constitutional. Though he may also say that such a government hardly exists in a country under a totalitarian rule where the constitution is seen with contempt. For this reason, it is only in a democratic country that constitutional government can be said to exist. Dear students, let us look upon constitutionalism in Nepal. The constitution of Nepal 2015 is the present governing constitution of Nepal. Nepal is governed according to the constitution which came into effect on 20th September 2015, replacing the interim constitution of 2007. The constitution is largely written in gender neutral terms. Some of the important aspects of the constitution include the following. The constitution restructured Nepal into a federal republic. The constitution divided the nation into seven provinces and completed the transition of Nepal from a constitutional monarchy to republicanism and from a unitary system to federalism. The federal system is established with three tiers, federal government, provincial level and local level. The guiding principles of the holding together type of Nepalese federal system are based on coexistence, cooperation and coordination that is three C's. Nepal is defined in article 4 as an independent, indivisible, sovereign, secular, inclusive, democratic, socialism oriented, federal democratic republican state. A bicameral parliamentary system was created with two federal houses and unicameral parliamentary system in each province. A mixed electoral system was adopted for the elections of the lower federal house with both first past the post and proportional electoral aspects used to elect members. The rights of gender based minorities are protected by the new constitution with provisions of special laws to protect, empower and develop minority groups as well as allowing them to get citizenship in their chosen gender. The rights of women were explicitly recognized. The constitution stating that women shall have an equal ancestral right without any gender based discrimination. Acts leading to convergence from one religion to another were banned and acts that undermine or jeopardize the religion of another prohibited. At the same time, the constitution declares the nation to be secular and neutral towards all religions. Nepal also has continued not to use the death penalty. Nepal had abolished capital punishment in 1990 
after the promulgation of that year's constitution of the kingdom of Nepal. The concept of constitutionalism in less developed countries embraces three major aspects. Number first, a development aspect, fulfillment of social and economic aspiration of the people. Number second, political aspect, an adult franchise and a system of government. And number third is liberty, equality and a system of justice in order to transform the concept of rule of law into a living reality. These three aspects together produce a deliberative democracy where constitutionalism and democracy can live together without theoretical conflict. In addition, effective and meaningful public participation in the constitution making process is a major force underlying an effective constitution. This force recognizes that the sovereignty of a nation is vested in the people and endorses the idea that the people determine their own fate through constitutional principle. Without public participation, the people become subject to a few affluent powers. Even if the resulting constitution institutes all possible constitutional principles, it misses the real notion of democracy and constitutionalism. Nepal has never been introduced to a real democracy. The concept of democracy has been laid out in the constitutions of Nepal since 1948, but never were the people recognized as the source of power. The people of Nepal were neither provided with the opportunities to participate in the constitution making process nor were they regarded as an absolute sovereign entity. The system of government was either handpicked by the king or dominated by disorganized and unaccountable political parties. Therefore, the constitutions in Nepal since 1948 can be categorized as fake constitutions. Prima facie, they may seem normal or even proper constitutions, but in practice, Nepal's constitution have been fake constitutions. Constitutional provisions are disregarded so that as far as democracy and constitutionalism are concerned, they are in effect dead letters in trap constitutions and without constitutionalism. Nepal ranked 97 out of 167 most democratic countries in the world according to Economic Intelligence Unit 2018. Today, we have a democratic republic constitution which in its form and substance has tried its best to ensure democracy in all aspects. It entrusts 31 fundamental rights, a fully elected legislature through free and fair elections, multi-party competitive democracy, checks and balances and a free and independent judiciary. However, Nepal was surpassed in the aforementioned ranking even by constitutional monarchies like Norway, Sweden, New Zealand and Denmark which ranked 1, 3, 4 and 5 respectively. Nepal's 1990 constitution based on constitutional monarchy was considered a remarkable achievement and many still believe that it was better than all the constitutions formulated till date. I believe that failure of the 1990 constitution was not because we desperately needed federalism and inclusivity. Rather, it was because we failed to ensure constitutionalism that is our other's organs including the judiciary, parliament and civil societies 
failed to deliver and restrict. Furthermore, the federal government and political leaders in Kathmandu have taken so many actions that undermine the spirit of the constitution. According to them, the fundamental problem is Nepali leaders who drafted the constitution themselves have failed to comprehend what constitutionalism means. Experts on constitutional and political affairs say sovereignty vested in the people, limited government, the principle of separation of powers, independent judiciary, human rights and fundamental rights and inclusive governance system are the components of constitutionalism. The breach of any of these components means an attack on constitutionalism. Nepal's constitution provides for checks and balances by dividing the government into three parts, the executive, the legislature and the judiciary. According to senior advocate Surindra Bandari, any of the branches overriding another results in breach of the principle of separation of powers, thereby crushing the very idea of constitutionalism. Oftentimes, says Bandari, the judiciary appears to be taking a position not to antagonize the executive. This is because meritocracy has often been compromised while picking judges and justices. Bandari told the Post, we can't expect a constitutionalism to become strong when the judiciary is weak. According to him, democratic principles, federalism, republicanism, secularism and inclusion, the pillars of the constitution have come under attack in several instances. There seems to be a lack of understanding about constitutionalism, said Bandari. Raju Prasad Chapagain, chairperson of the Constitutional Lawyers Forum, said in the simplest form, constitutionalism is adherence to a constitutional system of government. Actions of the executive, the legislative function of the parliament, the judiciary's role and constitutional bodies, constant watch to ensure proper checks and balances as well as media and civil societies call for accountability are necessary to strengthen constitutionalism according to him. However, except the media and civil society to some extent. No other agency has performed their expected roles, thereby weakening constitutionalism, said Chapagin. Dear students, let us look upon constitutionalism in Burma. The constitution of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar is the supreme law of Myanmar. Myanmar's First constitution adopted by Constituent Assembly was enacted for the Union of Burma in 1947. After the 1962 Burmese Kudita, a second constitution was enacted in 1974. The country has been ruled by military juntas for most of its history. The 2008 constitution, the country's third constitution was published in September 2008 after a referendum and came into force on 31st January 2011. The Myanmar constitution has 15 chapters. Chapter 4, 5 and 6 concern the separation of powers between the legislature, judiciary and executive. The Tamadao Myanmar Armed Forces retain significant control of the government under the 2008 constitution. 25% of seats in the parliament of Myanmar are reserved for serving military officers. The ministries of home, border affairs and defense have to be headed by the serving military officer. The military also appoints one of the country's two vice presidents. Hence, the country's civilian leaders have little influence over the security establishment. Proposed changes 
to most parts of the constitution must be approved by more than 75 percent of both houses of the assembly of the union for some others it must do so then go to a referendum when the referendum is held the changes must be approved by at least 50 percent of the registered voters rather than 50 percent of those voting Myanmar's current constitution in force since 2008 is exceptional. The document not only took effect after a 50 year long military regime but was also drafted by individuals close to Tamadaw. As a result, while it represents a certain level of progress towards multi-party democracy and the rule of law. The 2008 constitution also ingrains the Tamadao in Myanmar's state institutions. The commander-in-chief can appoint three key ministers, those for the interior, defense and border affairs, placing the entire security apparatus under military rather than civilian control. He also appoints at least 25% of the seats in national, regional and state legislatures, giving the Tamadao an effective veto over constitutional amendments, which need the approval of more than 75% of the members of union parliament, the national legislature to pass. Beyond this, the judicial system places courts that adjudicate cases involving defense personnel under the sole responsibility of the commander-in-chief. The National League for Democracy was established in 1988 after widespread student-led demonstrations against Myanmar's military regime. The party and its leader, Aung San Suu Kyi represented a significant part of democratic opposition to the regime until the party won its first general election in 2015. The NLD had boycotted the 2010 election which was won by the military-backed Union Solidarity and Development Party. The Aung San Suu Kyi was under house arrest at the time of that election and was only released a few days afterward. However, encouraged by former Myanmar's president Thin Sin's conciliatory approach toward it, the NLD ran in by-election in 2012 and won the 2015 and 2020 general elections each time by a landslide. The 2015 election was the first time since 1960 that Myanmar's voters had been able to elect a parliament that would form a civilian government. This newly elected executive had no previous government experience and faced structural constraints. The constitution provided for a power sharing arrangement between the government elected and unelected Tamadao representatives. Beyond the military regime's ability to block constitutional amendments, the Tamadao's consent was also needed in the ongoing peace process, in which it is a major stakeholder. Myanmar's lack of progress on urgent reforms can be partly attributed to the Tamadao's ubiquity in all of these transition processes. Notwithstanding these constraints, the November 2020 election showed that an overwhelming majority of Myanmar voters decided to trust the NLD again. Despite the coronavirus pandemic, voter turnout was high at 71.6% and the party won 79.5% of the elected seats in the parliament. The USDP and Tamadao rejected the results, alleging 
fraud and irregularities that undermine the credibility and fairness of the electoral process and its outcome. However, the Union Election Commission, Myanmar's electoral management body, rejected these accusations, stating that any errors were not on a scale that could discredit the election result. National and international observers, including the US-based Carter Center, issued statements and reports indicating that the election had been conducted in accordance with international standards and principles. Unhappy with the election results, the Commander-in-Chief assumed power on 1st February 2021 and the battle has since been about the constitutionality of his actions. As the Commander-in-Chief did not suspend the constitution, he seems to be seeking legitimacy by claiming that his actions were legal and justified by election irregularities. But despite obvious gaps in the constitution, most if not all actions taken by the military regime have no constitutional or legal grounding. The Tamadao detained Yu Win Mit Dao, Aung San Suu Kyi and other high-level government officials without presenting charges against them. Charges were only brought against the president and the state councillor after their detention. If the charges amount to grounds for impeachment, according to constitution, only the union parliament can initiate an impeachment procedure. But the parliament was illegally hampered from holding its first session, scheduled for 1st February, as security forces kept members of parliament in their residences. Myanmar's president was immediately replaced by the Tamadao nominated first vice president Yumit Siu as acting president. Yumit Siu then convened the National Security and Defense Council with only military members attending and declared a one-year state of emergency. He also transferred all executive, legislative and judicial powers to the commander-in-chief. The constitution stipulates that the president has to inform the union parliament of a decision to declare a state of emergency. If the parliament is not in session, the president must call an emergency session. This did not happen. Hence, the state of emergency and all decisions made on that basis can only be regarded as unconstitutional. As a result of the power grab, a civil disobedience movement was launched and massive demonstrations were organized in cities such as Yangon, Mandale and Napida. On 5th February, 289 elected NLD members of parliament announced the establishment of the committee representing the union parliament. The committee claimed that it was Myanmar's sole representative body, declared Yuvin Myth the country's lawful head of the state and government, and initially expressed its commitment to the 2008 constitution. On 26th February, Myanmar's ambassador to the UN pledged allegiance to the committee as have an increasing number of ambassadors since. Although the committee representing the union parliament did not reach the necessary quorum to constitute the first session of the new parliament, it has increased its membership over time and negotiated with armed ethnic groups to establish a government of national unity. On 31st March, the committee released Myanmar's Federal Democracy Charter, including a new interim constitutional arrangement for Myanmar meant to supersede the 2008 constitution. To conclude, the present constitution of Nepal is the seventh introduced in a span of as many decades. 
strengthening constitutionalism is necessary to ensure that the present constitution lasts long and become more effective. The public frustration will grow if the state machinery fails to function effectively and independently, which will ultimately increase distrust in the constitution. In case of Burma, the democratic reform has suffered a grave setback. The result of 2020 election in which parties close to the military suffered significant losses, motivated the commander in chief and his aides to take decision making into their own hands and going beyond the existing constitution and engaging in a massive and violent crackdown against popular discontent. The struggle is one for legitimacy. Dear students, I hope you have enjoyed the lecture. Thank you.